Perhaps you're familiar with the term BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal. The term was made popular in the 1994 business book, Built to Last, Successful Habits of Visionary Companies by James Collins and Jerry Porras. Collins and Porras defined the BHAG as a long-term goal that changes the very nature of a business. A BHAG often seems impossible to outsiders, but those on the inside are convinced that it can be done. And it often changes history in a positive way. In the 1940s, a pioneering heart surgery ended the inevitable death of so-called blue blood babies. Called the blue blood baby operation, Johns Hopkins surgeon, Dr. Anthony Blaylock, his technician, Vivian Thomas, and pediatric cardiologist, Dr. Helen Talsig, devised a means for improving the flow of oxygen in the blood by connecting one of the, uh, one of the arteries in the heart to another artery that fed into the lungs. Something the Lord Made was a film about this surgery. When our third grandson was born, we learned that he had a heart defect that required open heart surgery a week after his birth. And we learned of this daring surgery and dream that Dr. Blaylock had as a pioneer in heart surgeries. It literally saved our grandson's life and the lives of many more. Dr. Blaylock's BHAG changed histories. In the United States in the 1960s, President John Kennedy made a famous speech called, We Choose to Go to the Moon. Climbing Mount Everest was a BHAG. Amazon's vision statement says, Our vision is to be Earth's most consumer centric company to build a place where people can come to find and discover anything they might want to buy online. God is a big God, and his plans are so vast, we cannot fully fathom. But the BHAG I want to talk about is at the very center of God's plan. Unlike a corporation or other man-made organization, subject to weaknesses and limitations, God's plan will certainly be accomplished in his way and in his time. And God's plan is bigger than we can imagine. It's better than we can dream. And it's bolder than we can fathom. If we embrace God's plan, it will change how we view God and others. It is a game changer. Recently, the incident in the United States of a white police officer kneeling on the neck of an unarmed black man, George Floyd, for almost nine minutes, causing Floyd's death, has forced all of us to examine our own prejudices and fears. Does the color of a person's skin make a difference to God? Should it make a difference to us? I think we find in our text today a word that should shape our attitudes towards other people and also ourselves. We're starting today a two-part series, and today we look at the beginning of the story, the creation of mankind, the beginning of humanity. Next week, we will look at the amazing truth of God's new humanity. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. We'll be looking at two passages, Genesis chapter 1 and Psalm 8. Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. 
male and female. He created them. And then in Psalm 8, beginning in verse 1, which is a reflection of the Genesis passage. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds, the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Genesis is the book of beginnings. Here, the creation of the earth and the universe and the human race. And the psalmist reflects on God's creation and asks, what is man? Some translations read, what is humankind or mankind? What does it mean to be a human? That question is at the very center of philosophical and theological concerns. Here, man is said to be made in the image of God. Or it could also read, man is made as the image of God. What does this mean for us? It's an important question. Philosophers and theologians have tried to answer the question. Philo, the first century Jewish philosopher, said that this image of God is a reminder of the dignity and value of every human being, every person. Augustine said that the image of God is man's intellect, not the body, but the mind was made in the image of God. The 16th century reformers stressed our potential in the image of God for moral integrity, purity, justice, holiness, illuminated reason, true knowledge, and righteous will, all showing the excellence of original human nature. Rationalist philosophers said that the image of God is a divine spark in every person. Self-consciousness, self-determination, or intellect. And the Swiss Reformed theologian Karl Barth focused on the aspect of relationship. He said the image of God means that we can relate to God and to one another. Who are we? I want us to look at this passage and see from the text that each of us and all of us, people as a whole, humanity, is created in the image of God or as the image of God, and we are thus unique. One of the pastors in the IBC, David Stevens, who pastored in Belgium, wrote an insightful book called God's New Humanity. And in the book, he said that this unique image that we are made of in God's image involves three things, rule, resemblance, and relationship. These three things tell us who we are and what God created us for. We will see from Psalm 8 that the majestic God gives every person dignity. He does it out of his love and grace, not because of ourselves, but in spite of who we are. Our dignity also tells us a lot about God, and it should cause us to fall on our knees in worship and then get up and see ourselves and others, every other person, in a new way. Notice, first of all, that God created us to rule over creation with him. The passage says, let us make man in our image 
in our likeness and let them rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. This word translated image refers to a physical shape or form, a resemblance. Often the word refers to idols. And of course, one of the Ten Commandments says, no graven images. Why was that? Well, pagan deities were portrayed in that way. They were made of wood or stone. Also in the ancient Near East, the pagan king stood as the image of the gods. But in creation, all mankind shares equal status as God's co-rulers. But God commands no images. He's a spirit. How can he be seen? In us. We are his image. We are not gods, but God created us to show his greatness, to be his image. And how is that? Well, the psalmist says, let them rule. We are God's co-rulers, created to rule over his creation. Not to abuse or misuse creation, but to rule over creation as the crown of his creation. Adam was told to work and grow the garden, to name the animals, to rule over them. And the psalmist repeats this idea of ruling in Psalm 8, uh, verse 6. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. And the psalmist is amazed. He doesn't say that we are a little better than the animals, but rather a little lower than the heavenly beings or angels. It's good for us to realize how small, minuscule, and weak we are in comparison to the vast universe. And to remember that the universe is small in contrast to the majestic God. It is the work of his fingers. But, although small and weak, we are called to rule with God. Amazing. God is mindful of us and cares for us in our smallness and weakness. He is more interested in people than planets. We've already seen how man is also translated mankind. Same word. The idea is that humanity in its entirety, the human race, is the image of God. We have a position of honor, and so does every other person. Dignity, respect. We were created to rule over God's creation with him. But not only rule, secondly, God created us to resemble him as creator. We read in Genesis 1:26, then God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness. The word for likeness means a resemblance, a model, a shape. Recently, our uh, eighth grandchild was born, a boy. His name is Jericho. And yes, his dad's name is Joshua. And he assured me that he was fit for the battle of Jericho. Laurie, my wife, was with our daughter and family when the corona pandemic hit. When she told me the news, I quickly wondered, who does he look like? And whose likeness, mom or dad, or maybe grandmother or grandfather, which member of the family did the boy resemble? God is spirit. So we cannot say that people or humankind looks like God in a physical sense. But how do we resemble God? Perhaps the key is in the next chapter of Genesis where the story of creation is retold. It tells us that after God formed the man from the dust of the ground, he, and I quote, 
breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being or a living soul. God gives to people a spiritual nature, unlike the rest of creation. A carrot never ponders or questions the existence of God, nor does a dog or cat. A bird builds a nest out of instinct, not realizing that God placed this instinct to prepare for the birth of a baby bird. We are created to, raise, to relate to God in a way that the rest of creation does not. Our spiritual nature resembles God's own nature. It's a capacity for self-awareness and self-determination. Before the fall of man, recorded in Genesis chapter 3, man has had God's moral integrity, his holiness, and his justice. As human beings, we are more than animals. We are dust, and one day our bodies will return to the dust. But God breathes into us a spiritual nature, an ability to know him and love him and to love others and ourselves. He gives us a creative nature to make things through imagination and thought and skill. We resemble our creator. Because of this, we are responsible for our actions. Is it any wonder that the psalmist says that we are crowned with glory and honor? And he goes on and says, only mankind considers the heavens, the works of God's fingers, the moon and the stars which he has set in place. The rest of God's creation never wonders about these things. But we do. Although weak and needy, we have the capacity to know and praise our Creator. So the psalmist says, From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. In other words, even the weakest and neediest of us is wired for praise. All righty. And then thirdly, God created us to relate to others in community. Genesis 1, 26, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Our translation and most translations emphasize the relational oneness of God. But notice in the text the words us and our when speaking about God. It is not blatant nor fully developed, but we have here a veiled allusion to the most intimate relationship between Father, Son, and Spirit. God is one, yet he lives in intimate community. The very word for God used here is a plural term, Elohim. It has been understood in various ways, but in the context of God's creation, we see the Spirit active from the very beginning. As in chapter 1 and verse 2 of Genesis, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. We come to understand the clear teaching of three in one, the Trinity, only later in Scripture with the coming of Jesus, who is the Son of God. But here at the very beginning of the story is this plurality within the unity of God. We all know that basic to later Hebrew, Hebrew faith was the Lord our God. The Lord is one. But in some way, God has eternal fellowship within himself. He is a social being. Why did God create man? 
Well, it was not because he was incomplete or lonely. And it was not because he needed mankind. He enjoyed the fellowship of himself as father, son, and spirit. There was love, the deepest love and intimacy. In the New Testament, Jesus, speaking of his relationship with the Father, prayed, Father, you loved me before the creation of the world. Eternal love within God himself, Father to Son. Why did God create us? God created humanity out of his overflowing love. Love demands that there is someone to love, and God is love. Michael Reeves wrote a small book called Delighting in the Trinity, and he says that we can say God is love only because God is Trinity. The teaching of the Trinity in Scripture is not a problem to be solved. It's not an oddity, but it's actually a solution and delight. Most illustrations of the Trinity, like an egg that has a shell, a yolk, and the white, or a shamrock leaf with three parts, or describing the three states of water as gas, liquid, and solid, are really not helpful. Rather, the truth that God is one yet has existed in loving community since eternity should bring joy because God's love is an overflowing love, not a needy love. Perhaps a better, better illustration is that God is like a fountain. God overflows in love. The harmony of God brought harmony to creation. The German musician Johann Sebastian Bach signed his masterpieces S-D-G, Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. And he also conceived of harmony in his music to reflect the cosmic harmony of the divine musician. Not only is there this focus on God's relationship and community, with himself. But out of that, there's also the emphasis of humanity in community. Verse 27 of Genesis 1, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The translators struggled with how to translate man in these verses because the same word can refer both to man as a, a male, and to man as humanity. You see it, him and them. So we have one Adam, yet two, a man and a woman, and later in scripture, the many people, all of them referred to as man. Here's the point. Like our creator, we are created for community. We are not complete in ourselves. We were created with a need to belong. And we have a longing for belonging. Individualism, independence is a lie. No man or woman is an island unto themselves. God says in chapter 2 and verse 18 of uh, Genesis, it is not good for the man to be alone. In that context, Adam needed an Eve. But scripture teaches us that it's not good for any of us to be alone. We all need others in our lives. We're hardwired for it. You cannot love without having others to love. Made in the image of God, we find fulfillment only in family, only in relationships. And the one race, the human race, was created to be a family, relating to God and to one another. 
It's amazing that God created us in such a way as to know and relate to him. It's part of our image made in God's likeness. No wonder the psalmist in thinking about God's glory and grace, who he is and what he has done, and his reaching down to relate to us in our world begins and ends the psalm of praise. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The Westminster Catechism asks the question, what is the chief end of man? And it answers it in this way. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. We should be astonished that God turns to us and he acts for us. He cares for us. He has made us rulers over nature. And that is wonderful. But our first and most prized calling is to serve and worship him, the one whose name, whose glory and goodness has been revealed, as the psalmist says, to children and infants. A final thought and a few applications for living. We've talked about being made in the image of God as rule, resemblance, and relationship all a part of being created in God's image. And this is part of God's BHAG for us. It's what he created us for. It's the big, hairy, audacious goal to rule over creation with him, to resemble him in his likeness, and to relate to him and to one another in community. All of this in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. But then comes chapter 3 of Genesis. Sin enters the world as the first man and woman turn their love away from God and inward toward themselves. In the following chapters of Genesis, we read about the devastating effects of sin. And it says that man went east alienated from his creator. How far did he go? Well, in chapter 9 of Genesis, we see how people were divided geographically and politically. They were scattered. In Genesis 10, mankind tries to build a name for himself by building a tower to reach heaven. And God confuses their language and scatters them lest they completely destroy themselves. What happened? We are the image of God. Was that image destroyed? Is there no hope for us? Is there no way back to Eden? Well, early on in chapter 3 and 16 of, of Genesis, we read about the first uh, glimpse of hope. That one day, one would come from the seed that a descendant of woman who would destroy the power of the serpent, the evil one who led the first couple away from God. And after the first sin comes the first sign of hope. And then in Genesis 12, we read that God calls a man, Abram or Abraham, whom he promises to bless and whose family would be a blessing to all peoples of the earth like a masterpiece that has been defaced the image of god that's us is marred but although god's image is defaced and damaged it is not destroyed we have been compromised but there is hope all of us have gone astray but God's plan, his BHAG, is not finished. Next week, we will see what he has done. And it is truly an amazing story. 
Let me close with two applications for living. In light of what we have read in God's word, I think it challenges us to do at least two things, maybe more. First of all, to bow and find your purpose in life. To bow before your majestic creator, realizing who he is and who he has made you. The eternal God knows you and cares for you. As the song says, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious. We are precious in his sight. He created you, and you will find purpose for living only when you kneel before him as Lord. Give him glory and enjoy him. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Puts all things in life in their proper place. There's only one creator, and it's not you or me. There's only one savior, and it's not you or me. Bow before him as creature, and you'll find your link to the creator and the freedom to be what God created you to be, the very image of God on earth. Turn from the lie that you can be your own God and bow before the true God. You are not, as William Ernest Henley writes in Invictus, the master of your faith, the captain of your soul. But you were created in the image of God. You are precious, loved, shaped with purpose built for relationship, and so is every other person. Bow before him. And secondly, believe and find your place in God's world. Believe in your dignity as the crown of his creation, and also in the dignity, the worth, the value of every other person. God has plans for your life that are greater than you can imagine. You are not a nobody. Everybody is somebody before God. Human life is sacred to God. Every human life. We are too precious to, to God to waste our life on lesser things. No matter who you are. No matter what you have done, no matter where you have been, God is ready to welcome you back to himself when you come to him, just as you are. And he will work in your life and through your life in ways that you cannot even imagine. What are you missing today? Meaning, purpose, forgiveness, freedom, peace. Hope, strength, these are the very things that he wants to give you when you realize that he is the master of your fate, the captain of your soul. Today, let the fountain that is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, sprinkle you, drench you with his love. And only then will you find purpose in your life and your place in this world. Let's pray together. Lord, we live in a world that is confused, where there is great fear, mistreatment, injustice. We don't have all of the answers, but Lord, we know that we need to start with ourselves and realize that you have created us in your image, in your likeness. I pray that you would help us to see who we are in light of who you have created us to be. And Lord, that we would also be able to view every other person in light of who you've created them to be. 
In Christ's name we pray. Amen.